face the day.
outshining all the stars in glory. Oh, your love is like the wildest ocean. Oh, nothing else compares. Oh, you are the Lord Almighty. Oh, outshining all the stars in glory. And your love is like the wildest Nothing else compares.
1 Peter chapter 1. We're just going to read verses 1 and 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with His blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Heavenly Father, I pray as we just take a few moments, Lord, to look at these verses, God, that you would help us to understand the role that we play here as believers on this earth. That you change our minds, and divert them, Lord, away from thoughts that would be unhelpful. Work in our hearts, Lord. Change our desires to be in line with your will. And God, give us courage, Lord, to act on the faith that we have in our heart and mind. I thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The title for the message this morning is A Chosen Sojourner. I think Pastor and Sister Drake have probably felt that way this past month. A Chosen Sojourner. That word sojourner means, uh, in the vocabulary.com dictionary, it means a temporary resident. A chosen sojourner. That phrase I got from uh, Wayne Grudem, he, he wrote a commentary in the Tyndale New Testament commentary for 1 Peter. Very good commentary. If you ever want to study 1 Peter, I'd recommend it. His name's Wayne Grudem. Um, the author of this epistle is the Apostle Peter. It was probably written in Rome, roughly between 62 and 64 AD, so we're looking at approximately 30 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Um, it was most likely written to Jewish and Gentile Christians, a mixture of both. And if you were to keep your spot in those first two verses of chapter 1, but flip over to chapter 4, verse 19, some scholars have looked at this verse as a very good summary of 1 Peter. So chapter 4, verse 19, it says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So you could say a very simple purpose for this letter is to encourage believers in the context of the world that they live in to endure suffering while doing good for the name of Jesus and to put their hope in the future of his coming. That'd be kind of a general idea of what 1 Peter's all about. Now, there's a bunch here that we could talk about. We're just going to stick in those two, first two verses. But I want to talk to you this morning, just real briefly, about a chosen sojourner. And I want to give you six things in these two verses, these first two verses of 1 Peter. Six things that a chosen sojourner knows. Six things that a chosen sojourner knows. Now, what do we mean when we say a chosen sojourner? If you look in verse 1, it starts off and says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. When you think about Peter, if you go back to the Gospels, you've got all kinds of stories about Peter. There's, there's, there's no shortage of information about Peter. He's probably one of the more well-known disciples of Jesus, mostly for bad stuff, <laughs> at least in the Gospels. Man, he sure does know how to put his foot in his mouth. He's the disciple who denies Jesus three times and the rooster crows. He's also the disciple that's named specifically when Jesus rises from the dead. Go tell the disciples and Peter that have risen. He's the only disciple that we know of that Jesus called Satan. 
get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> Thankfully, he didn't literally mean he was Satan. <laughs> um, Peter's an impetuous individual. We find out later in Paul's letters that uh, Peter gave in to peer pressure at, at one point from his Jewish believers to uh, not sit with the Gentile believers because he didn't want to be associated with them. And he gets verbally thrashed by Paul for doing so. So there's even prejudice in the New Testament. <laughs> but it gets snuffed out quickly. <laughs> So Peter, is, he's, he, he identifies himself as Peter, an apostle. Apostle means sent out. So disciple is one who follows and learns from a rabbi. An apostle is one who's been ordained to go out and to spread the teaching that he's learned. He has authority to represent the rabbi to the people he speaks to. So Peter says, I've been sent out by Jesus Christ. The Lord saves. That's what Jesus means. Christ means the anointed one. But then we see he's writing to those who are elect exiles. And that's where I get that phrase, chosen sojourners. It's another way of saying elect exiles. So, as we're getting started with this, the first thing that an elect exile needs to know is that an elect exile is chosen by God. Is chosen by God. You don't need to flip there. I'll, I'll read you just a, a verse in Psalms real, real, quickly, real quickly. Psalm 89 and verse 3 says this. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. Throughout the Old Testament, God chose specific people. And indeed, he chose the nation of Israel. He tells us that, and he tells the Israelites that. I chose you, and it wasn't for any reason, then that's what I wanted. It wasn't because you were a big nation. It wasn't because you had a lot of power. It wasn't because you were very attractive. I chose you because that's what I wanted to do. And so he starts off, and he describes his audience, which is probably Jews and Gentiles mixed up. Gentiles are just non-Jews. So you've got Jews and non-Jews that are believers in this audience. And they're from all over what is now modern-day Turkey. So if you look on a map, if you find Turkey, I always think of the meat when they say that. But it is a country. They probably don't think of it when they say their name. But if you looked at modern-day Turkey, that's where all of these uh, regions that they mention are. Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. All those were in the same area. And some scholars think that this was meant to be well, it probably, it probably is a circuit letter. In essence, Peter wrote it to multiple audiences, and he wanted them to spread the letter around. Once you read it, copy it down, send it to somebody else. And he's got this region in mind. And this region of believers is experiencing suffering. We don't get a lot of specifics, but some of it has to do with the fact that some of the Gentile believers in this, in this congregation, when they came to Christ, the Gentiles that they lived around were surprised that they were no longer engaging in the sinful practices that they used to. And so part of their suffering, at least, is persecution from unbelievers who look at their lifestyle and say, we don't like the way you make us feel uncomfortable. <laughs> now, there's probably several other things we could pick out, but we're just going to focus on this idea that in the world we live in, if you're a follower of Jesus... If you're a genuine follower of Jesus, you're going to endure suffering of some kind. Christ told us that. The disciples told us that. This isn't, this isn't news to anybody who knows Scripture. There's going to be times where you do what, what Jesus tells you to do, and that makes you immediately the enemy of everybody else in the room. You're that guy or that girl. <laughs> you're the one that everybody says, why can't they just go with the flow? Why do you need to make a mess of everything? Just, just be quiet. Don't make a fuss. Don't ruffle feathers. Just whatever the easiest path is, take it. But we all know, right? When you follow Jesus, sometimes Jesus takes you through the exact path that you would not take on your own. 
<laughs> you look at that decision, you say, that is a bad decision. And Jesus says, no, that's my decision. And so one of the things that the believers had to begin to realize is suffering is going to be part of the Christian life. you got to learn how to find joy even though things don't go the way your human nature says they ought to. But the people of Israel, they were chosen by God for a special purpose. And if you were to read from Isaiah 49, verses 5 and 6, one of the primary purposes that you and I will probably find very significant about the nation of Israel is that God told the nation of Israel that they were going to be a light to the Gentiles. He was using Israel as an example to show the world around them, this is who I am, and this is what I expect of you, and this is what you will have if you belong to me. Now, no, I'm not giving any spoiler alerts away. Israel miserably fails at being this. They absolutely fall on your face. You couldn't face plant harder than Israel did in doing what God told them to do. They miserably failed. But as we find out in the New Testament, God knew this was going to happen. And it was part of his plan. Because one of the key figures in the Old Testament that the prophets began to speak of was the suffering servant. The suffering servant who would take on the iniquities of God's people and bring deliverance. The Messiah. In Greek, Christos. In English, Christ. So when we look at the elect exiles, the first thing that we ought to remind ourselves is, Scripture tells us in John 6 that no one can come to Jesus unless the Father draws them. God has to move in your life and bring you to Christ so that you can see who He is. We're so sinful, we're so messed up, we don't even know we're messed up until the Father draws us. And at that point, if someone hears the gospel and they believe that Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross and rose again and through Him I find forgiveness of sins and eternal life and reconciliation with my Creator, if somebody believes that and they confess Jesus Christ as Lord and they believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead, they are saved. If you're saved, you're one of the chosen. So if you want to know, am I one of the elect? Ask yourself, have you believed the gospel? Do you look at who Jesus is, and do you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that he's your Lord? If you do that, you're one of the elect. And you need to remind yourself of that. Not just that you have faith in Jesus, but that the reason you have faith in Jesus is because first God chose you. And that's, a, that's actually a, a relief. Because there's been any, of, any number of things that I've chosen that I wasn't so sure I chose the right thing. But this choice wasn't up to me. The first thing that happened was God says, I want you to have the ability to know me. And I'm thankful he did that. So that's number one. I'm chosen. So the first thing you need to ask yourself, are you one of the chosen? Have you trusted Jesus? Have you believed the gospel? The second thing that a chosen sojourner needs to know as they're in this world of suffering. This is only temporary. He calls them, to, he says, to those who are elect exiles. An exile is a temporary resident in a foreign land. A temporary resident in a foreign land. If you were to look at Genesis chapter 23, verse 4, Abraham is speaking. 
Genesis chapter 23, verse 4, and he says this. <clears throat> Abraham says, I am a sojourner and foreigner among you. Give, give me property among you for a burying place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. So Abraham's pretty clear to the people he meets. I'm not from around here, but I want to do business with you. I've got things that I need to do. You guys got what I need. Will you, do, will you work with me? And you on a regular basis, now in the 21st century, have much the same predicament. You're not in the situation you're in if you're a follower of Jesus, necessarily because you planned it this way. You're in the situation because Jesus said, if you really believe I am who I say I am, then you need to follow me. And Jesus takes us to some pretty foreign places, doesn't he? Sometimes those foreign places are unusual or uncomfortable circumstances. Those conversations that we normally would not engage in. Those sacrifices we would normally not make. But because our minds are not on the fact that we're, we're, we're not setting down roots here. <laughs> this, this world is not where all our, all our eggs are not in this basket. In fact, none of our eggs are in this basket we're just waiting until we can put our eggs in the basket they're supposed to be in. <laughs> so while we're here, we've got to live. We've got to live. And we have to live around people. Be in the world, but not of the world. And so we have to interact with an unbelieving, ungodly world and make ends meet until God's promise is fulfilled, just like Abraham did. He had no idea what the future held. Jesus, King David, nation splitting in two, all these different things we read about. He didn't know any of that was going to happen. He just knew God had given me a promise. He told me where to go. I'm here. i got to figure out how to live for this God that I've just met. And hopefully, he's going to do what he said he's going to do. I believe he's going to say, I believe he's going to do what he said he would do. And you and I are in that same situation. We can't avoid the world. But we always remind ourselves, this is not where my home is. This is temporary. My retirement plan, my investments, my 401k, all, all the stuff, all, all the possessions, all the things that, you know, that drawer, the random drawer in your house, you guys got those? Why? We all have it. Or the, that, that stack of just... Some of you have garages, right? The garage is usually for a car. Not anymore, right? Because you keep accumulating stuff. And some of you, you're driving down the road and you see that advertisement or you watch on your phone, you're like, oh, hmm, I need that. An air fryer. All right, let's do it, right? And, and, and this world's mindset is just get stuff. And if you can get enough stuff, there's enough padding that maybe you don't experience the bad stuff. You can just push it off, okay? Oh, I had too much in my air fryer. Okay, now I need to go to the gym. You know? <laughs> and we try, to, we try to live life, but we get distracted by the place we live in. This is the problem that the Israelites have. They lived in the promised land, but because their mind was not on God, they were continually being distracted by these false gods. And by these sins that all the nations around them did. And instead of separating themselves and living a unique, holy life before the Lord, they, they started making concessions and compromises. And, okay, I'm, I'll give in a little bit here because I really want to experience this. And I know God's not really happy with it, but, no, I'll just ask him for forgiveness later. And we, we keep taking steps into the world and, be, and becoming assimilated with it. And Peter says, you're elect exiles. This is not your land. You're not meant to be here. This isn't meant to be a pleasant experience overall. This is meant to be a place where you're enduring until you get home. I'm not living for the here and now. My reward is not this life. Thank you, God. This is not my reward. <laughs> Goodness. Have you seen our economy? I want to cry when I look at the gas pump. I want to cry, but this is not my home. 
And so with that in mind, we gotta, we've got we to gotta balance our expectations with reality. I can't expect this life to be wonderful all the time because it's not a wonderful world. It's a broken world. I still see beauty, and it's good. It's, it's fine to have a, a wonderful day. It's fine to have a day where you smile and you're happy, got a, got a bounce in your step, shake hands vigorously. It's, it's okay to have days like that. But it's also okay to not be satisfied and to want to go home. So when you think about living here, remember, remind yourself, just like in Judah, when Judah was exiled by Babylon, for 70 years they lived in Babylon, a pagan nation, surrounded by false idol worship, sinful practices, all day long, every day. For 70 years they had to live there. And Daniel, Daniel in chapter 9 of Daniel, he prays to God and he says, we've sinned against you, we deserve to be here, but please get us out of here. And God told Judah when they were going to be exiled, you need, to, you need to build homes, live amongst the people in Babylon, because you're going to be there 70 years. Get used to it. It's not going to be a short time. But I will bring you back. And so you and I remind ourselves, when this world deals us a bad hand, which tends to happen very often, it shouldn't, it shouldn't defeat my hope because it wasn't hoping in this world anyway. Third thing that a chosen sojourner needs to know, we need to be aware of God's foreknowledge. We need to be aware of God's foreknowledge. Look at what he says. Verse 1, he says, To those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, Actually, I'm sorry, I skipped one of my points. My bad. We're not only here temporarily, but we're only temporarily away from home. That sounds like the same thing, but it's not. You can know you're not going to be here forever, but not be thinking about where you're supposed to go. And when it says dispersion in verse 1, to, to those elect exiles of the dispersion. Dispersion means to go out. They're spread out. They're scattered. It's not talking about Jews leaving Israel. It's talking about believers not being with the Lord. We're dispersed among a sinful world, and we're waiting for the day that we get to go home. And just like some of you who've had to move from different states, right? When you found out you had to change locations, you began to study where you're headed, what it's going to be like, what's the weather like, what are the gas prices? <laughs> can, I get, can I get a place to buy? Do I have to rent? Where can I rent? Am I going to have to rent in a neighborhood where I have to carry a firearm? Am I going to have to pray when I get in my car every morning just for safety? Like... Is there a school nearby? You start looking at the, as, at the place and you begin to focus your mind not on where you were living, but you begin to transition to, okay, it's no longer about here. I'm going to be leaving here soon. Where do my priorities need to be in the place that I'm going to be? And the whole of the New Testament, this is what God is preparing us for. He's saying, you, you have to be here until Jesus comes back. And while you're here, you're a light to the unbelievers and you are pursuing Christ. You're walking in the Holy Spirit. You're being used of God. And you are preparing yourself for the move. For that moment when the trumpet sounds and you change locations. Some Christians have gotten so used to this life that they live as though dying is the end. And they're, they're afraid of dying because all that they hoped for was in this life. And there's been times that probably some of you, when you, wanted to, when you were going to have to move to a new place, you dreaded going to the new place, and you, just, you dragged your heels and your feet. I don't want to go. I don't want to. 
I don't want to leave this house. I don't want to get, I don't want to sell my car. I don't want to have to find a new, and you're just complaining the whole time. Oh, I have to give up all this stuff and go to a new, and heaven? Anybody, right? Yeah. But some of us live like there's nothing to look forward to. Like it's all right here. And so when we make a sacrifice, we're grumbling the whole way. Like, oh, got to pay my tithe again? Again? Does God expect me to raise my tithe with economy? Do I have to? (laughs) Don't tell me some of you didn't think that. But this is the point. Not only, is our, not only is our suffering and the disappointment that we'll experience here temporary, but we're going someplace so much better. And that's how we manage the suffering here. It's not because the suffering is easy or it feels good or we enjoy it. No. And, and God doesn't expect us to enjoy it. But we look at the suffering and we see that it's producing a far greater result of glory. And so we look at the sickness, we look at the, the, the pay decrease, we look at the failing economy, we look at the politicians, and in our human spirit, we're like, man, this is lame. But our spirit man looks at this and says, it wasn't about this anyway. Who cares if it goes bad? I'm not even going to be here when everything goes as bad as it could be. Jesus is coming back. I'm gone. I'm going to be with Jesus. It's going to be awesome. So... Whatever suffering's going to come my way, you know what? I'm going to find joy because I've got Jesus. I've got everything I need in him. This suffering's temporary. And 10,000 years from now, when I look back at this 10-month period of financial stress or whatever it is that you're dealing with, it's going to be like so small. And why was I worried about that? Look where I am. This is amazing, right? This is the kind of mindset we need to have. It's not about the suffering you get here. So we need to remind ourselves our chosen. We're in this location temporarily. We make the best of what we have, but we're looking forward to a way better place. Number four, we need to know about God's foreknowledge. Foreknowledge means to know beforehand. So when it it says in verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, it's saying that God knew who would choose him before anything happened. God knows everything. He knows everything. There's nothing outside of God's understanding or knowledge. Which means he knew the people who would hear the gospel and would choose, yes, I want to be a follower of Jesus. And with that in mind... He knows every step your your life is meant to take. He knows the times where you're not going to listen to him. And so he adjusts his plan. And he's going to get you home. Now this is why God's foreknowledge is important. Because he already knows what's going to happen. I don't need to be stressed. Can you imagine driving down the road... Your engine light turns on. Your car begins to break down. You slide it into neutral and you coast. Oh, look at that. There is a service station right here. You pull into the service spot. The employee walks out and says, is your car broken down? You say, well, yes. I know exactly what the problem is. And you know what? Today is a discount. I'm giving you the parts and labor for free. And you say, wow, that's amazing. It's like you knew this was going to happen. He's like, I know. He fixes the car, and you go on your trip. Now, that sounds really silly, I know, because every time that happens, there's not a service station in sight. Your car breaks down, and you don't have AAA, So there's nobody to call but any relatives that may be in the same state as you. But here's, this is the point. That is the way we should treat crisis. He already knows. He already has the plan. 
And if I'm paying attention, I'm going to be exactly where I need to be. And just like you look at that, that silly, highly irrational story that I just told you, like, Pastor Jordan, seriously? If you look at God's foreknowledge, that is what is happening. On God's end, there's no surprises. Everything is flowing exactly as he knew it would. And if his chosen exiles are aware of it, they're going to be exactly where they need to be when the crisis hits. And since I'm not putting my eggs in this basket, the crisis doesn't scare me because whatever I lose here, I wasn't meant to have anyway. And whatever I gain there is going to be better than what I was trying to fight for here. The fifth thing. A chosen sojourner knows about the Holy Spirit sanctification. Verse 2 says, According to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit. So if you notice, I, I, I don't know how to explain it in a simpler way than this. The three, sorry, the four things that are listed in verse 2 the foreknowledge of God, the sanctification of the Spirit, obedience to Jesus Christ, and sprinkling with His blood, those four things are all being applied to the situation of elect exiles in a suffering world. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. All those things are being directly applied to what Peter is saying to people who are suffering in a temporary foreign land waiting to go home. And so when he talks about the foreknowledge of God, he's saying God knew you would go through the suffering you're going through. And when he talks about the sanctification of the Spirit, he's telling us that people who are chosen by God to follow him, everything you go through, everything is being used to perfect you. I'm just giving you a second to think about how messed up your life is. And then I'm giving you also a second to remind yourself who you are. A chosen exile. And Peter says, you're a chosen exile in, that means you're in the midst of, the sanctification of the Spirit. So as you struggle and sometimes fail and come back and try again and you walk with Jesus, you are in the sanctification of the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is using the problems you're facing, the probably really stupid decisions you make sometimes, those thoughts that you're wrestling with, those desires you're wrestling with, and because you chose Jesus... The Holy Spirit lives inside of you and he's working with you and saying, okay, Jordan, not the best decision. You need to confess that. Get that away from you. And I want you to focus here. And look at what he says. If you go to verse, um, let's see, where is it? If you go to verse 7 of chapter 1, or start at verse 6. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while... If necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter says, now, for, he's like, for a little while. You, you, ever, you ever have a doctor say, it's going to hurt a little bit, right? <laughs> Sometimes it's true. But Peter's saying, now for a little while, it's going to be rough. And you know why Peter says it that way? Because Peter is looking at Jesus. He looks at Jesus, and he looks at the suffering, and he looks at Jesus again, 
And he says, yeah, that's pretty small. The stuff you're going through, if you look at it, it looks pretty bad. It looks really bad. It looks anxious stress bad. It looks high blood pressure. I need some Xanax. Like bad, 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 bad. How are we going to... God, how are we going to get out of this? God, do you, see, do you see this problem, God? This problem is huge. I have never faced a problem this big. How are you going to get me out of this? The guy down the street had the same problem. He didn't get through it. Look at Jesus. Just stop looking at the problem. Look at Jesus. He already knows. And he's going to use whatever he allows you to go through to help you make it. The sixth thing. A chosen sojourner knows obedience and purification in Christ. A chosen sojourner knows obedience and purification in Christ. Now this obedience part You don't need to raise your hand, but if you're with me, just affirm it in your heart. We have a, wonderful, a wonderfully horrible tendency to think that obedience is something that we do through willpower. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to be the best Christian I can be, and I'm going to get it out. Yeah, I got this. It's like going to the gym. You psych yourself up, and you're pumping the irons. I got this. Yeah. I get that weight off. Salvation is not done through willpower. Your faith isn't perfected through your willpower. You don't, you don't make yourself stronger in Christ. You let him do the heavy lifting, and you give him the praise. He's the God of the universe. He can handle your puny little problems. They're nothing to him. He, he knows the solution right now. He's like, this is not something to get stressed about, Jordan. I already got the way out. Focus on me. And so obedience isn't me proving to God that somehow I've arrived. Oh, God, I'm the, I'm the man now. You can, you can count on me, Jesus. I'm going to do this. You see this problem, God, that's coming up? I'm going to have faith that knocks the Satan socks off. Yeah, I'm going to do it. Come on, bring it on. No. You don't have anything to do with it. You're along for the ride. You trust Jesus. He does everything. He does everything. The Holy Spirit perfects you. God shelters you. No one takes you out of Jesus' hand. Your faith isn't in your own hand. You're in Jesus' hand. He's got you. And he's not going to let you go. What you've got to focus on is as you walk with Jesus, when he tells you to do something, okay, God, give me the strength to do this. And you do what he told you to do. It has nothing to do with your ability. It has everything to do with your faith. Do you trust that Jesus will get you through it? And if you do, he's going to. Guaranteed. Not, easy, not three easy payments of 1999. No shipping and handling. That's a freebie. God's word. So the obedience is done by... God gives me the power to obey Him. He conditions me and sanctifies me so that as I walk with Him, I become more and more obedient. It's not willpower. But here's the other thing, and this is, this is the point that we'll close on. He says he's writing to elect exiles of the dispersion, and then in verse 2 he says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ... And for sprinkling with his blood. Now, when I was first studying this message, what I wanted to do was I wanted to take every Old Testament alliteration that I could find and point it out as we went. Because just in, just in this one chapter, there are tons of Old Testament alliteration that's going on. Tons of things that are pointing back to the Old Testament saying, hey, you remember that in the Old Testament? Hey, you remember when Moses did that? Hey, you remember when the priests did that? Yeah. Hey, you re hey did you read that? 
obscure verse in Leviticus. That's what it was talking about. All through, all through 1 Peter, this is happening. But this is one, this is one place I'm going to slow down and explain this to you, okay? This last thing in verse 2 it says, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. Now, there's two ways that blood was sprinkled in the Old Testament. The priest would sprinkle the blood on the altar, and then they would sprinkle blood on people. Yeah? Yeah. Now, we won't get into the details as to why it's not sprinkling on the altar. But the thing you need to understand is, why do I need Jesus' blood? Because I'm a sinner. Hebrews tells us, without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. A life has to be taken to pay the, the sin debt. If the sin debt is paid, that person can go free. And so Jesus shed blood on the cross purifies me from sin. Now, the sprinkling of blood on people. I know some of you get kind of queasy. Stick with me, okay? I won't get too graphic. There's three instances that, that as I was reading the commentary on this, three instances in the Old Testament where somebody got sprinkled with blood, okay? Three instances. Instance number one was during the covenant initiation ceremony at Mount Sinai, where Moses sprinkles blood on the people of Israel. In essence, it's symbolic of the fact that they're being initiated into a covenant with God. And this blood being sprinkled on them is, is the symbol of that covenant being sealed. And I don't think that that's what it's talking about in this passage. Because the elect exiles are already in covenant with God. So it's not that one. Here's the second time that people could get sprinkled with blood in the Old Testament. Number two, the ceremony of ordination for Aaron and his sons as priests. They had to get blood sprinkled on them by Moses. And that can't be what this passage is talking about. Because... Later on in 1 Peter, he, he calls us, he calls elect exiles, priests. So we're already priests if we belong to Jesus. So it's, it's probably not talking about that. There's one more instance in the Old Testament where a human being was sprinkled with blood. And that's when a leper was healed and he went to the priest to go through the ceremonial cleansing so that he could be approved and become part of the people of God. To, to, well, he was still part of, the, kingdom, part of the, the kingdom of Israel, but he could be back with the people. He could come back into the city. Because if you were a leper, you weren't allowed to be in the city. You had to live outside the city. But if you got healed and you went to the priest and the priest looked at you, did the proper procedures and said, yes, you are healed of leprosy, he would go through the purifying ceremony, and you could go back into the city. And this is the one that Wayne Grudem thinks that is being referred to when Peter says, and for sprinkling with his blood. Now why is that? You've been forgiven. When you trusted on Jesus, your sins were washed away. But if you think about it, uh, I'll read this quote to you. This is from Wayne Grudem's commentary. I am painfully aware of my remaining sin. I'm a Christian. I've trusted on Jesus, the righteousness of Christ. I'm, I'm clothed in, but I'm still a sinful man. I still have a sinful nature that I have to put to death every day. I still, I still have to wrestle against sin. I still have to choose not to give in to temptation. And I am painfully aware of the remaining sin that I struggle with in my life. And that God's purpose, 
which is obedience to Christ, God wants you to be obedient to Jesus, will never be completely fulfilled in this life. As long as I'm drawing breath on this earth, I'm going to have a sinful nature that I have to resist all the time. But this is why that should not be exhausting to you. Because of the blood of Jesus. It's as if as you walk through life and you are getting pelted by temptation and you stumble and fall, the blood of Jesus is being sprinkled on you your whole life through. And as you walk with him and trust him and confess that sin, that blood is covering you continually until you're with him in glory. And so as chosen exiles, I need to, I need to remind myself, I didn't, I didn't just gain the knowledge to become a Christian and just choose to come to Jesus all on my own. God drew me. He chose me. I don't let the things of this world overpower my joy because this isn't where my home is. My home is somewhere way better. My home is with Jesus. I don't get stressed about things that don't go my way because I, I know that God already understands what's happened and what's going to happen, and he already has the solution. I just need to stay focused on Jesus. And I need to remember that everything that happens in my life, all things for the good, of those who love God and called, each, called according to his purpose. I, I believe that everything that happens in my life, the frustratingly stupid things that I can find no meaning in, the Holy Spirit is using everything that I go through to bring me closer to Jesus and to perfect my faith. And I trust on him to give me the strength to be obedient. And I trust in the sacrifice he made for me because it's going to get me through this life.